Welcome to the Dynamics Lab at WPI. I'm Professor Norton. I'm going to show you a piece of equipment that comes out of a real assembly machine. Uh, this is part of a much larger machine. I'll explain a bit how it works. Uh, what we have here is manually operated, though in the machine it would obviously be run by a motor and some gear trains. You can see the motion. At, this is called the end effector right here. That's where the action will take place. Now, what is this thing doing? Well, you can see it's moving between two end positions. One of them is here, and one of them is here. And its purpose is to unload a part. I'll place a part in this so-called nest. I'll just sit it there. It doesn't really want to stay very well. That's good enough. So this is intended to come over here and pick up that part and then deliver it over to this chute, at which point it will be blown away with air delivered through this hose. It goes down a chute and gets put in a box eventually. It's a consumer product, one that's made in fairly high quantities at fairly high speed. This is one of perhaps a half a dozen stations on a machine of this sort. And these are typically conveyor machines, so the parts are being assembled on a conveyor that moves and stops, moves and stops, moves and stops, moves and stops. The final stop being here, this is the unload station for the finished product. So in the previous stations, it would have been adding parts. It puts the first part on in the first station, moves it to the next station, adds a part, et cetera, et cetera, until it is a complete assembly. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is not because of that, but rather because it's a reasonably good example of a, an application of cam follower mechanisms, cams and linkages, to a real um, mechanical problem. So let me run it through its motions again, now that you have a little idea of what it's supposed to be doing, so you can get some sense of its motion. It picks the part up. It delivers it over there. What I don't have operating here is any source of air to operate the grippers. It's essentially a little automatic pair of pliers. There are plier jaws here that when uh, brought down on the part, an air jet will be applied to this. There are two air cylinders that you can't really see very well. And those will close and grab the part, just as if you'd picked it up in your fingers. And now the air cylinders have it in its grip, brings it over to here, delivers it to the chute, puts it down into the chute, and here at this point, a solenoid valve would trip and the air pressure would be reversed on those cylinders and the jaws would open and drop it in, and then it, they come back empty to pick up another one and repeat the cycle, perhaps um, every second or so. If you look up at this end of the mechanism here, you can get some sense of how the motions are being created. Right here, I'm moving it back and forth through a portion of its motion where the assembly that carries the head is translating linearly left and right in two bearings where my fingers are located. That whole carriage is also carried on another slide which goes vertically over here. So you can see the vertical motion now if I go through this portion of its motion. So one is carried on the other. This gives me a two degree of freedom system and as you should understand from your kinematics, that requires that I have two inputs. And those two inputs, in this case, come from two cams. And we'll now show you those cams. We'll have to move this device to do that. Okay, we've turned it around so you can see the back side. And the portion you were looking at before is this assembly. I showed you how the vertical motion and the horizontal motion were coupled together. Now you're able to see what's driving them. This orange device is a cam. As I turn it, you can probably detect the fact that it has a change in radius. I really should turn it in the direction it's intended to go, which is clockwise. And you can also see the roller that's riding on the cam. And that roller, in turn, is on a link, which is pivoted here. That link has attached to it a connecting rod up here. Here's the connecting rod. And that's going over to drive the horizontal carriage that I showed you before. So this cam then is providing the horizontal motion. And the other cam, which is less visible, hidden behind the orange one, is painted sort of a 
bilious purple here, uh, is driving a link which is pivoted at this juncture, has a roller on the other end of this screw, which you can't see, you can't see the roller very well from your present vantage point. We'll show you another shot of that later. The roller is right under my finger, and that's riding on the second cam, and that in turn drives this link, call that link two, which in turn has a connecting rod, let's call that link three, that's pivoted to the uh, input link two here, and the connecting rod in turn drives the vertical slide up and down. So we have two coupled motions then. So I mentioned earlier it's a two degree of freedom device, and the two freedoms are controlled by the two cams respectively, but in this case they're coupled together on a single camshaft, which I'm turning via this knob uh, to simulate the motor input that it would really receive. Notice there was a sprocket here. It was chain driven from a shaft down below in the actual machine. So we have two coupled degrees of freedom. In addition to that, I'm going to turn this even more to show you some additional detail in just a moment. We have a passive coupled motion within the end effector, and I'll describe that to you after we move this machine into a better position so you can see it. Okay, here we are looking at the front of it again a little bit closer, and what I want to point out to you here is how the, the designer of this, very clever uh, designer I think, managed to get another coupled degree of freedom without introducing a third cam. Now notice that as this goes through its motions, not only does it move in X and Y, but that end effector also has to rotate so that it is lined up correctly to go down and grab the product right there and then in turn lined up properly at the other end to dump it into the chute. Now how did he get that rotation? Well so far I've shown you how this gives two linear translations. One is vertical, you can see the vertical motion right there. See my finger going up and down. And the other is horizontal. You can see my finger going right and left right there. And those two are inherently coupled because notice the horizontal motion is contained within the vertical slide. It's relative to the vertical motion. This piece that I'm pointing to right here is attached to the two horizontal slides. And that's effectively carrying this end effector assembly, which I'm pointing to right here. That's one of the air cylinders, that gold colored piece. Now that assembly is in turn pivoted right there on that screw to this block on the end of the horizontal slide. And thus it's able to turn, which is what we want it to do to change its orientation from one end to the other. That rotary motion is induced simply by the fact that this four bar linkage, actually a dyad, which if you include the other two pieces of the system would make a four bar linkage, but just look at this dyad right here. One end of which is attached to the horizontal slide, the other end of the dyad is attached to the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is, the, this is the vertical slide and this is the horizontal slide, so it's, it's coupled between the two. So they're using the relative motion between the vertical and horizontal slide to get their rotary motion. So with two cams, both of which are coupled to the wheel that my hand is turning off camera, which you saw before, I'm getting effectively three kinds of motion, two translations and one rotation. And of course, since this is a two-dimensional device, yes, even though it has a third dimension, I'm operating in a 2D plane. You should know from your kinematics that any rigid link in two dimensions has three degrees of freedom, and two of which are X and Y, and the third is theta, and this mechanism is controlling all three of those and putting the part from one position to the other. This, by the way, is of a, called a pick-and-place mechanism. It's of that class of mechanism. It's a rather complicated pick and place mechanism if you think about it. I've got these two slides, a lot of parts, a lot of bearings, and one of the issues with this particular design was uh, vibration because we have some rather long links hung out 
uh, cantilevered away from their supports. And when you start to run this at high speed, you can imagine you're going to get some vibration issues at the end effector. And that can um, cause it to not be in the right place at the right time and thus give you difficulties in your machine operation. Um, some of my students a couple of years ago redesigned this entire assembly and replaced it with a, what, a, what ended up being an eight bar linkage driven by a single cam. Uh, which gave the same end positions and end angles and ended up being a simpler mechanism and much more robust and less vibration prone. So this, I hope, gives you some idea of how cams and linkages are applied to real machinery. Well, you've seen a demonstration of the pick-and-place mechanism that used two slider mechanisms plus some additional linkage to rotate the the grabber, which uh, moves apart from an assembly line into some kind of a, a offloading chute. Uh, what I'm going to show you now is the redesign that two of my students did some years ago, which I mentioned when I was showing you that device, uh, to replace this fairly complicated mechanism, which I show on the first slide over here. You recall seeing this mechanism. I ran it through its paces for you. And Timothy Baird and Michael DiDonato, who are both mechanical engineering students at WPI, did their senior project to redesign this to solve some problems that the manufacturer was having with uh, inaccuracy of location of the end effector because of vibrations that were engendered by essentially the, the sloppiness of this mechanism. It's rather um, large. It has uh, extended cantilevers and so forth, and these sliders tend to wear. So they redesigned it, and this is what they came up with. Now, it may not make a lot of sense to you as you watch it move there. It, it does look still relatively complicated, but I can tell you it's less so than the previous mechanism. And I'm going to walk you through a description of uh, how they designed it and what it does, and you'll see this movie again uh, before we're done. Here was the methodology or the scheme that they came up with to uh, attack the problem. They decided uh, that pin-jointed linkages would be an improvement over the slider-type mechanisms that were present in the original mechanism. Pin-jointed linkages are very repeatable. We can make them stiff and robust. We can get very good joint lubrication because all the joints are rotating, not sliding. And you may recall that the other device had uh, two cams driving it, which effectively, though they're coupled, so you can use one motor, uh, in effect, you have a two degree, free, two degree of freedom linkage if you need two cams. So we, we sought to get one cam, making it a true one degree of freedom device. And they used a number of tools to do this. You see them listed at the bottom bullet there. They used ProEngineer to do the CAD design of their physical parts and geometry. And they used a program called SIMEC, which stands for Synthesis of Mechanisms. And I'll give you a very brief introduction to that in a moment. That runs inside of ProEngineer. They use program 4-bar and Dynacam. And the last three of those, uh, accepting ProEngineer, come with your textbook. So they had these design goals uh, after some discussion and some examination of the original mechanism. They, they actually made that device that I showed you earlier in terms of the mounting details, that is, they took the assembly off the production machine, it was a scrap or a spare device, and uh, they made the, essentially the base plate and put the handle on it so they could move it through the motions, as I showed you, and that gave them some insight into how it worked. And they saw that they needed to have good approach angles for the pickup and the delivery. They had to come in at the right angle to grab the part off the indexer, and they had to also deliver it in the right orientation. They sought to have low-value transmission angles, and they did succeed at that. They wanted simple motion. They did not want to have a lot of uh, excess movement of the grabber. Had to keep away from obstacles on the machine, and we wanted reasonably short link lengths. They decided also to use the original grabber mechanism, which worked perfectly fine. Here you have a, a close-up of the two little air cylinders that drive the pinchers. You can see the pinchers right there. It's essentially two little pairs of pliers that go down and grab some detail on the part to lift it out of the nest and deliver it to the end position. So what they're going to do is take that off, 
that's fastened right here, and grab it by some other means on their new mechanism. This is a cross-section of the machine, which they created in Pro-E. It shows the indexer. You're looking down the barrel of the gun here. This indexer is moving out of the page towards you intermittently. Move, stop, move, stop. That's what's meant by an indexer. And the indexer has a number of nests on it, and each nest carries a product, which is right there. And the grabber has to be in this position in order to take the part out of the nest, has to lift it up, rotate it, just about 90 degrees it appears, and bring it over here to what they label point A and deposit it with a downward motion at which point, of course, the S-cylinder has let go, their grab on it, and drop it into a chute and then it gets blown away by an air jet. So that's essentially the task. Bring this grabber mechanism, which they're going to reuse, over here, run it down into the part, fire the air cylinders, grab it, pick it back up, Re rotate it to the appropriate orientation and bring it over to the appropriate location. Bring it down. They needed a downward motion over here to strip it off the, the little grabber pliers, and that's essentially it. So to do this, as I said, they use Pro-E and Cymec. Now what I'm showing you here is the same picture you saw before, but superposed on it is a schematic of a four-bar linkage. It's labeled here, his link two, which is a potential crank. It might not really be a crank if it's non grashoff Here's a coupler, the triangular piece. And the coupler is going to be uh, attached to, or perhaps better said, the grab is going to be attached to the coupler, physically, rigidly attached. And finally, the rocker and then the ground link. So there are your four links, two, three, four, and one for the ground. Now, the, the problem is to find some set of link lengths and some size of coupler and shape of coupler and locations of these fixed pivots in places where you have something to screw the pins to such that you get the kind of path motion you want. Now the approach that's used by Cymec, the mathematics behind it, is the same as is described in chapter 5 of your textbook. If you look at the section labeled a uh, three-position synthesis with specified fixed pivots. I think that's the title I gave that section. Uh, you will see the mathematics behind what Cymec is doing. It's essentially taking three specified positions that you declare. You want this part to be in three positions, shown here, and using those three positions and a lot of mathematics to determine for your choice of ground link positions here and here, what the link lengths need to be. So we need three positions, and I showed you only two before. The two are the two end positions, which are required, and really no option there. They created a third position, which you see right here. Uh, you see the grabber tilted slightly and lifted up with the part in its grip. And this was somewhat arbitrarily chosen, not fully arbitrarily, because they wanted to be able to have this thing come up more or less vertically out of the nest in order to clear the nest details. And then uh, once high enough, then it has to get itself over here and orient, reorient itself. So they chose, after several iterations, they ended up with this particular position. So now we have three positions, and you can see those drawn as the grabber in the three positions. It's easier to see, see if you look at the butt end of the grabber up here, which is where they're actually going to fasten to it ultimately. So the first position is here, the second position is there, and the third position is there. And you can see it's rotating between those positions as well. So what you do is create that part in Pro Engineer, replicate it, and put it in the other two positions that you care about, and make an assembly out of that. And once you have that assembly created, then you with a drop-down menu inside Pro Engineer, you turn on Cymec, and Cymec puts this a schematic linkage on there and allows you to drag these, well, I'm sorry, first of all, you have to attach the, the coupler of the linkage that it puts on there to your part. So you tell it you want this to be the first position, this to be the second, and this to be the third, and it magically attaches the coupler of its linkage to those three positions for the three um, positions in the plane that it's going to solve for. This shows you a couple of sample screens. Now the students did, I, f I don't know how many, probably a hundred iterations before they were done, playing around with different positions of fixed pivots 
And I'll tell you, it only took them about a day to do those 100 iterations. So it's a very, very fast process. So this shows you just two solutions, intermediate solutions they came up with, both of which were rejected ultimately. But this is a screenshot from Pro Engineer. So you can see the part in three positions, as you saw on the schematic a minute ago. These are the attachment points where the coupler, you can see the coupler shaded with yellow lines. The coupler is attached at these three positions, and you can control that within SIMEC. This is the first position, the second position, and the third position. The fixed pivots happen to be here and here, and there, wherever they ended up after they dragged them around. You literally pick them up with your mouse and drag them on the screen, and you see this coupler curve change dynamically as you do. So the coupler curve indicates the path through which the part, in this case the grabber, will move from position 1 to 2 to 3, <clears throat> and that changes quite drastically as you move the pivots around. If you've seen the coupler curve tape, you should have some understanding of, of that process in respect to how coupler curves vary quite uh, distinctly with changes in linkage geometry. Here's a second solution. Now their fixed pivots are up here and here, and you can see the curve is very different. Going from the first position to the second, it goes up like that, and then it looks like there's a cusp there, and it comes back down over here and drops it into the chute. They need this uh, downward motion here. Recognize that this grabber is rigidly attached to the coupler. So it's following this path. <coughs> OK. Once they, this is their final design. The fixed pivots ended up here, and you can see the link is geometry. <coughs> and this shows the coupler curve of the actual tip of the grabber, the pickup point. They're actually fastening to the grabber other than at the pickup point, but that's irrelevant for this picture. This is what the tip is doing. Every point on the grab will have a different coupler curve, obviously. So it comes up out of the nest nearly vertically for a short distance, rolls over, follows this path. It's, the orientation change can't be seen in this picture. This is just a track of the tip of the grabber. So you don't really see how it's changing angle. And over here, it comes in and drops it in the chute and over travels slightly. By, this, by about this point, the air cylinders have given up their grip on the product, and it's fallen into the chute and they wipe it off, essentially, with this excess motion. Then it re reverses. So they're just using a piece of the coupler curve, which means that these links have to rock back and forth. And they could drive either link 8 or link 6. And you want to drive the link that has the smallest total angular motion, because if you have too much angular motion, your transmission angles are going to be lousy. Uh, for example, if I'm trying to drive a link through 120 degrees, then, and I make that symmetrical about a center point, so it goes plus or minus 60 degrees, then with a little trigonometry, you can figure out that your max and min pressure angles are going to be of the order of 30 degrees, which is considered the minimum uh, reasonable value. You'll have a 90 degree pressure angle somewhere in the middle. Uh, so 120 degrees is about as much as you can stand for a rocker motion being driven by another crank and conrod. So in effect, to drive this through a limited motion, such as the angle at link 6 wants to go through, they're going to add a driver dyad. If you're not familiar with that terminology, you can look in chapter 3. And in the first couple of examples there, it may be example 1 or 2, I show you how to add a driver dyad to a linkage that's been synthesized to do some kind of motion. The dyad will add two more links. You'll notice that these are numbered 6, 7, and 8. That gives you a clue as to how many links they're going to end up with because this is the output end of the system. Well, it turns out that this link 6 uh, went through a smaller angle than link 8, but unfortunately, link 6 was going through 141 degrees. And that was over the 120 desired maximum. So we, ha we need another stage in between the dyad that only makes this thing rock and this piece of the linkage. So this now shows you a little better picture of that same linkage that you've seen up until now only schematically. This is a Pro-E drawing, and it's been, the links have been fleshed out. So link 6 now has some meat on it. It's the green guy. Here is link 7, which is the coupler. Here's the grabber fastened to the coupler. That's going to stay with the coupler and rotate with it. Here's link 8 back to ground. So here are my two ground pivots. They created a base plate, a vertical base plate, 
which is this piece over here disappearing off to the side. Here's the indexer again coming out of the paper at you. Over here you see a uh, axonometric type view of this, give you a little better sense of how these are layered. They have to pass over one another, so each of the three links is in a different plane. And not only that, but the two pivots are in different planes because otherwise they won't pass by one another. So the physical pivot for link 8 is over here, and the physical pivot for link 6 is over on a different plate, this being cantilevered off of the main base plate over here. You can see the grabber here attached to the coupler. This is at the delivery point. The product's about to be dropped in the chute, which is right here. There's the chute in this view. So the problem now was, how do we get this to go through 141 degrees? Well, a typical response to that problem is to add a drag link segment or stage to the linkage, which in combination with your output linkage will give you a reduced input angle. This drag link, which has, a com it has in common with the thing you just saw, link 6, shown also in green, so that's the same link 6. It has a new link labeled 5 and another link labeled 4. Forget 3 for the moment. Just concentrate on this little 4-bar linkage right here. This is of the class, it's a Grashoff double crank, also called a drag link. One fixed pivot is there on link 6, and the other fixed pivot is there on link 4. And f they, they did a manual synthesis of this. They didn't use Symec, but they could have. But they synthesized this manually to get 141 degrees of output of link 6 in response to 62 degrees of input to link 4. Now we can handle 62 degrees driven by another dyad, which is going to get us up to the eight links, uh, because then I'll have something in the order of 60 degree uh, transmission angles at either end, because I'm only going plus or minus 30 off of a central position with this link four. That brings us finally to the stage, what I've labeled stage one, which is the cam drive into link four. So now we need another driver dyad to make link four go through the 62 degree angle, which is made symmetrical about the vertical for convenience. So a fairly long conrod brings that motion of link four back over here to a location where we have a camshaft available. So we're going to put a cam on this, which drives a roller on what's labeled link two. Link two is connected to link three to four. The angle over here is only 17 degrees, so the cam only has to rotate link two through about a 17 degree angle because of the ratios of these links, that becomes a 62 degree angle on link four, which in turn becomes a 141 degree angle on link six, which then drives the coupler curve as you like. I had to design a cam to drive this whole thing, and some of the factors they took into account here was that they wanted to have low peak acceleration, they wanted to have symmetric and smooth functions, uh, SVAJ, you may recall, our displacement velocity, acceleration, and jerk. They wanted these functions to be continuous through jerk. That will give them low vibrations. They wanted to minimize the dwells because anytime you're stopped, you're using up time that could be otherwise used to move something, and therefore you're going to cause higher accelerations because you've left yourself less time to move things. So. Uh, my approach to design of cams is always to try to minimize or eliminate dwells as much as possible. It turned out that they needed a true dwell for about 20 degrees at the pickup point because it takes some time for the air cylinders to release their grip and you've got to make sure that, the, uh, or, or actually in this case, create their grip on the part before you lift up and take the part away. So there's a certain time delay involved with the air cylinders responding. So they needed a true dwell there but at the drop-off point, they're essentially releasing the air cylinders and then swiping it off into a tray or into a chute. And we found that they could use a pseudo, what I call a pseudo dwell there. We just slow the thing down smoothly and then pick it back up again in the other direction. So these are the curves they came up with. Now these are B-spline curves, which is something you do not find in your design of machinery book. It's a more advanced form of cam function 
They actually use the professional addition of Dynacam to generate these curves. But they're much like polynomials, uh, except that you have these lines that you see here, these magenta lines, which represent something called knots. And it's as if you had a hold of that curve, and as you move the knots back and forth, you stretch it and shape it. And what they've done is move these two outer knots, left and right, and they've flattened the bottom of this. This is the pseudo-dwell at the drop-off point. You'll notice this goes from 0 to 340 degrees. The other 20 degrees is the true dwell when they pick up. That's not shown here. But look at how smooth these functions are. This is the displacement curve. It's a um, fall-rise continuous function. It's one function from here to there, uh, containing the fall and the rise both. The velocity curve is smooth and continuous with the dwells at either end, as it must be. Likewise, the acceleration curve is smooth and continuous back to zero at the ends to match the dwells. And not only that, the jerk curve is zero at the ends to match the, the dwells, and it is also smooth. So this will be a very low vibration function. It turns out that the peak acceleration was not excessive when they did dynamic calculations, which we won't go into here today. This is a profile of the finished cam. You can see just from its appearance that it's a very gentle cam. It doesn't have sudden changes. It has, in contour, it has uh, a very large radii of curvature. It has very low pressure angles. The pressure angles are shown over here. They're only 11 degrees positive and about 18 degrees negative. And the minimum rates of curvatures are well within, in fact, they're generous, 3.8 inches against the 0.625 inch follower radius. So. A very gentle cam. Let's go back and now show you the movie in somewhat more detail, and I'll uh, explain a little bit of what's going on here. If you look first at the, the end effector motion, there's the grabber going down to pick up the part, and here it's coming over to deliver the part into the chute. And again, it's carried on that gold colored link, which we called 7. This is the greenish, uh, I'm sorry, the red link is uh, link 8. And that's pivoted at this point. Let's run it again. The green link is link 6. And that's the one that went through the 141 degrees, which was too much to drive directly from a, a cam-driven dyad, such as this guy over here. So what they did was replicate link 6 on the other side of this base plate. You'll notice there's a, a twin to it over here. The base plate is put in, sh in uh, transparent form, so you can see through it. So you can see the other piece of link 6 over here, really the same link, it's just split across the base plate. And that link 6 is also obviously going through the 141 degrees. The purple guy is, is what we call link 5, the connecting rod for the drag link mechanism. The orange one is the driver of the drag link, which we call link 4. That's going through roughly 62 degrees. And we're getting that 62 degree motion. Notice that the point of application of the motion into link 4 is not at the same point as the connecting rod uh, joins. It was made such that it was symmetrical about a vertical line so that this dyad over here would be uh, have equal variations in uh, transmission angle through its motion here. Finally we have link 3 back to link 2 and there's the cam in purple driving the system over there in a spring to keep the joint closed. So here you have a much more compact, all of the business is, is accomplished right here with these very short links with good sized pivots, nice bearings on the pivots. There is some cantilevering of the grabber off of the link. Uh, that was unavoidable in this case. But in general, this thing has very small uh, beam lengths and thus is relatively robust and stiff. So a better solution overall than what was originally um, seen on the machine, which is, of course, the thing you saw demonstrated earlier. So to sum up, then, they've created an 8-bar linkage formed from a 4-bar plus 2 dyads in series. It's a pin-jointed, single degree of freedom design. Only need one cam. It's a compact design. No interference with surrounding machinery. Has short, stiff links, no sliders, and is very robust. So that pretty much sums it up. So now you've seen... I, two, two ways to solve the same problem. And this, of course, is an infinity of other possibilities for the same problem as well. You've seen a linkage design probably, I would say, 25 to 30 years ago with what were considered to be 
state-of-the-art design techniques at the time, typically modified trapezoid cam profiles for uh, the two motions, two cams, one to give uh, an X motion, the other to give a Y, coupled together with the Y writing on the X or vice versa. A clever linkage that you saw in the uh, demonstration of the old machine uh, on the end effector to get a passive rotation out of the motion so they didn't have to provide a third cam to get the rotation. That was a nice design for its time. But its flaw ultimately was it was relatively um, vibration prone, a little bit on the weak side, difficult to adjust. It had too many adjustments. I didn't mention that the, the new design by the students was uh, one that has only two adjustments, which minimizes the potential for machine operator error when they set it up improperly. And in all, this was considered to be a superior design which the manufacturer intended to implement on the machines. So I hope that gives you some idea of what real machinery looks like and how we go about designing uh, elements for real machines. Thank you.